Hey guys, what's going on? Chris from Flying Lap Media. In keeping up with the idea of making original content that we ourselves want to consume, we thought, what if we could sit down with a racing legend like Emerson Fittipaldi? We found the opportunity to do just that at the last round of the Scusa Winner Series, and we spoke with Emma quite a bit about making his way from karting to Grand Prix Superstardom. We chat a bit more about the differences between drivers then and now, and get a terrific glimpse into the mind of a multi-time racing champion. It's a wonderful look and an all-around great human being, and I think you'll enjoy. All right, sitting here with uh, two-time world champion and two-time Indy 500 champion Emerson Fittipaldi. What an honor it is to get to chat with you a little bit. Um, really just wanted to kind of sit down and, and pick your brain. You're such a racing veteran and have so much knowledge. And uh, we're here at a, at a go-kart race with a lot of young drivers looking to perhaps crack that nut and make their own way into motorsports. And, wanted to sit down with you. You have so much knowledge and so much experience and what I was hoping to do is maybe just uh, ask you a few questions to really try to get some of that knowledge and experience that some of these younger drivers can use to, to help further their careers and, and their own experience. So did a little research and, and found out some interesting things about you. Uh, as an example, uh, you were named after a poet, is that true? Ralph Waldo Emerson, yeah. Chris. First, it's a great pleasure to be with you. Um, I think, uh, you know, thanks for, for the words you give to me, but um, my advice, well, the reason why my name is Ralph Waldo Emerson, my mother uh, was born in Russia, uh, the father immigra immigrates to Brazil, and then my father was Wilson, and my brother Wilson, because uh, President Wilson won the first war. And then my grandfather, Italian, who immigrates to Brazil, wants to give American name and give Wilson. And then when I was born, if it's one Wilson, what's another name, American name that she could find? My, my mother was a great fan of Ralph, Ralph Waldo Emerson. She read many books of Ralph. And she said, it has to be Emerson. And uh, lucky because I love the name and uh, both my brother and myself, two American names. That's right, and your dad was a, a motorsports journalist as well, is that correct? He's, um, he had always the passion for motorsport, for sports, but mainly motorsport. He, he was broadcasting races to Brazil all the way. Um, the first one was 1949, when the first Ferrari win in the Grand Prix car, before Formula One, what was called Grand Prix car, and was driven by a Brazilian who I was one of my idols, called Chico Landi, okay. on the history of Ferraris, there on the books. And was the Grand Prix of Bari on the Adriatic coast. And my father broadcast the race live to Brazil by radio, wow. 1949. And were you able to listen to that? I was just too small. Okay, I was sure. just being born. I mean, it was too small, but it was historical broadcast. And the, and the Brazilian one, and typical Ferrari, the Comendatore Ferrari, had the emblem of the car on his pocket. <laughs> After he won the race, he put on the nose right, of the just car. Just in case, right? <laughs> just yeah. in case he yeah. doesn't win. Wow. But anyway, because my father's passion passed to me, uh, passed to my, you know, to my nephew, Christian, my brother, mm -hmm. uh, my grandchildren, and now Emo. Emo is my only son who really likes racing. And uh, you, you ask something, you know, what's advice to the young talents, this, you know, it's so great to, to see here on the go-kart track so much talent, so much uh, effort, so much dream to achieve to be a Grand Prix driver, to be a NASCAR driver, sure. to be an Indy driver, a Le Mans driver. I mean, these kids are so talented, but I always say the most important thing is to have the passion, dedication for the sport. And when things doesn't work, go to the next event, go to the next weekend. Mm -hmm. You have to persevere to succeed. You have to work hard. Everybody works hard in any sport to get to the top. Absolutely. You know, the talent helps a lot, natural talent for sure, but the effort, dedication behind, it makes the accomplishment. And number one, the passion, love for the sport. You have to love the sport. Absolutely. And I think, the, and I always say these kids, you know, they, they have dreams, they have to dream, and sometimes they think, oh, I'm not able to achieve. They have to dream and go for it. They will achieve. Mm -hmm. In the any sport, in any sport, sometimes you put like a barrier to yourself. 
Oh, I, I'm not, I cannot be, you know, like when I left to Brazil, my first dream was to be a Grand Prix driver. Uh, if I would start a Grand Prix, I could die next day and right. I'd be happy. Yeah. But, and then when I was a Grand Prix driver, I said, why not try to be world champion? But I, you have to go for it. Mm -hmm. and, and taking it back to karting, so did I read correctly that you actually built some of your very first karts? Yes, um, I built and I started a mini factory. Okay, and the same one that exists today, is that the same? By the way, Tessar is driving. I saw that. The, the Brazilian cart. Yeah. So and you he's doing well. That yes, with I brother. started uh, with my brother and Mario de Carvalho, who's still the owner, okay. is about eight, seven years old now. Um, he's a racing, he's a family who's building the carts. Uh, a great family. We're still very good friends and I start building the cart and then I build Formula V's, then I build a, a Porsche prototype, we build a twin engine Volkswagen. I mean, I always like to be involved in on the mechanical part. I've noticed, and where did you guys get the idea or how did you just begin to start building your own car? Did you have some instruction or did you kind of just try your hand and what works, what doesn't? Was the first cart in Brazil was 1958 or 59. Okay. Uh, I was only 11 years old, 12 years old. Uh, my brother was already a teenager, and he started driving for the new car manufacturer, uh, car manufacturer in Brazil, was the first one. Mm -hmm. My brother won the, I was his mechanic in go-kart okay. when I was 11, and uh, he won the Brazilian championship, and I was his mechanic because I, I had the passion. I would keep his go-kart immaculate, I wash, I clean, I polish. I chromed the wheels, I mean, I was crazy. Right. And uh, I think that's the type of love you have to, to love, to, to, the hard to work, succeed, right? to the hard work. And then uh, when I was 15, we started building our own go-kart. And did you have like the blueprints or just sort of an yeah. idea of kind of what worked? Or did you just sort of take maybe your brother's kart and, and try different things or variations? We, we did a different chassis. We, we, we first time we, we were very laid down like the enduro cart yeah. and I think we gain in the speed on the straight and that's our go-kart was different from we have pictures um, different from anybody else because we were, we were able to drive it quick being laid down and then very aerodynamic I bet. and it was was difficult to get used to the position but when you get used it was fast and from there you built your own Formula V is that correct and, and raised that yes okay and then you know it's I won the Brazilian Championship in go-kart and then the Brazilian Championship Formula V with my own uh, equipment. Mm -hmm. And and the reason why I was doing this because we were selling to sponsor myself. Sure. And that all the money I was making from selling the chassis, go-kart and the, the Formula V, I was investing my career for the future. And I, if I read correctly, so you sold everything and went yes. to Europe yes. and, and took a risk. And some of these drivers that you know you make a great point about the passion and you had no guarantee you, you just laid it all on the line sold everything and went yeah. to Europe with, with no ride as I understand right. it uh, talk some of the emotions of what that was like and just uh, you know just going there with basically no chance uh, other than your hard work your determination and, and your passion you, you know I at that time in England I think even today England was a very good place because motor race so developed in England every weekend you have the club races everywhere in England and they uh, Ford just launched Formula Ford not for Ford mm -hmm. at that time who was very economical you could run same engine the whole year and I was able to buy a car I went to Frank Williams uh, he was a dealer from Titan at that time and uh, with a, a very good friend of my a Brazilian English guy called uh, Jerry Cunningham and uh, we arrived from Williams, show my dossier formula, you know, racing go karts, formula, the uh, 50 Porsche, the prototype. And Frank Williams looked, is there a race in Brazil? <laughs> he couldn't believe it was racing. Right. And that was the beginning of what I call the Brazilians going to Europe. Sure. And, and there was. Uh, There's many more after followed, of many course. Many more, many more. And, uh, but Frank didn't have a, a Titan. It would take three months to deliver a car because mm -hmm. everybody. And then I went to the Merlin factory the next day, and one of the clients uh, didn't pay the car, and I was able to buy immediately yellow Merlin, like a Brazilian right. color. Yeah, yeah. And it was fantastic. 
we are they called um, Super Super Merlin because I raced the whole year. I wanted I was leading the championship, and then calling Vanderbilt race won the championship, and then uh, who was the next one from South Africa? The, uh, Formula One driver. Then he started driving my Formula Four. I will remember. Okay. But was a no. They called the Magic Merlin because it was winning everything. And and from there, if I read correctly, you caught the eye of a of a couple influential people, and it sounded like Jim Russell in that day yeah. uh, got you in, into the Lotus yeah. Fifty Nine. Is that correct? Was yes. that preparation by Ralph Furman? For Formula Three, the Ralph Furman uh, was his first job as a mechanic. Wow. And then he made the Van Diemen, and it was a fantastic car. Yeah. And you, uh, you won in only your third race. Yes. That's amazing. And, and then I, I adapted myself to Formula 3 very quick. Uh, Lotus was not winning a lot in Formula 3. And then when, when I started winning, Colin Chapman started looking, you know, who is this boy winning races on, my, on the Lotus Formula 3? That helped me a lot to go. Yeah. to Formula One, mm -hmm. for sure, because Colin asked me at the end of the year, you know, I arrived in, in, in February, in October, Colin called me, I was leaving Norwich, where the factory, the Lotus factory is, and Colin asked me to come to his office, I was shaking my, my legs, and I, I sit down in front of Colin Chapman, I said, this is Colin Chapman, and Colin said, Emerson, I want you to drive Formula One beginning of next season, and I had, sometimes in life you have, you know, you have to be brave to say no because I was not prepared. Mm -hmm. It was difficult. And I was thinking if I say no and he's not going to like it, he's going to invite me again or not. And and, uh, and I say, Mr. Chapman, I am not prepared. And he said, Emerson, you can call me. Call him, please don't call Mr. Chapman. I said, okay, call him. I did six months of Formula 2 before going to Formula 1 next year. And then he looked to me and said, okay. Do you want to start at the British Grand Prix in July next year? I say perfect. Then I did a half season Formula Two. Uh, Formula Two, that time he raced against the Grand Prix drivers. Because I mean, they, they would come down a lot of yeah, people don't realize. Graham that they, Hill racing, yeah. Jack Stewart, Jack, uh, Jimmy Clark, and some Jimmy, of these guys. All these guys race. It was a fantastic racing. And I learned a lot in six months and then I, I joined you know Team Lotus Formula One was but uh, it's always thanks God to be in the right time, the right place, with the right people to help me all my career, mm -hmm. all my career. And I think you, you bring up an interesting point that I see a lot of younger drivers here, and perhaps karting and, and even early formulas. They're they're very eager to move up to the next formula very quickly. And I think you you just touched on something very fascinating. You had the discipline and, and the self self awareness to say I'm not quite ready. And I think a lot of drivers, and I can let you kind of comment on this, are so quick to move up. And when they don't win right away, a lot of team owners or, or um, you know, team principals are maybe they think, okay, you don't quite have what it takes, and, and you kind of said, I need a little more time to develop. What are some of your thoughts on some of the drivers in today's modern day moving up too quickly, perhaps? You know, today races change so much, and I think, like Emo, uh, what, what these kids are doing here is fantastic. Because on my time, the karting was different, now it's so competitive. They go through so much experience of dicing, overtaking, hitting wheels. <laughs> you know, it's different from my time. Now it's much more competitive, extremely competitive. And and the, the base they have here in go kart will help any category in the world. Will help, you know, to race salon race, stock car, NASCAR. Uh, and I think that you have to have your own judgment. Sometimes they are much younger. I, I, I was already 21 when I arrived in Europe. It's different. I mean, these kids start racing go kart five years old, four sometimes. Right. It's crazy. But good, because when they'll be 15 years old, they have a good judgment. That's right. And that's years it. of experience. Yeah. And I think that's when you start counting on the decisions for the future. I think it's very important. I think the go karting. Uh, it's always good 
to learn with better people. Mm -hmm. It's like when you start playing tennis, if you don't play tennis with a better guy than sure. you, you you'll never improve. Level. And I think go-kart is very important. That sometimes important to move to the next category to, to learn. Yeah, so you're and not, the, yeah, you're, you're pushing yourself yes. against uh, the Different from cars. Yeah. Because then, and I think there's a difference there. And I like very much the, the, the way with the categories now, like Emo, we are looking to go to, to Junior. And then I know it's going to be tough on him, but he's going to learn with much awesome. better guys. Right. And that's for, for his futures, I think it's a fantastic way to learn. And I, you know, going back to, to the uh, Go-Kart Championship in America, so well organized, like Scusa, uh, we are very pleased to be here. Uh, there's all the tradition from Las Vegas. Uh, it's an international event. People from all over the world are very happy that they must participate. The level of kids here are extremely competitive. Uh, I think go-kart in America, we have been racing in Italy, is getting much more competitive. Uh, you really now don't need to go to Europe, to Italy to learn. You can learn here very uh, on a very good level. You know, I think three, four years ago, everybody said, I have to go to Italy. Now it's getting very tough here. Yeah, you see, competition has gotten much better. Junior, I mean, I watched the last two races here. These kids are, I mean, they, like in Europe. Yeah. They're really tough. And I think that's important for their future. You know? So um, kind of jumping back in, you explained to Colin, you needed a little more time. you done F2, but um, obviously, the, your career took a very quick, fast track, and uh, you got moved up pretty quickly to F1 under some sad circumstances, of course, with the Hulk and Rent. Yeah. Um, when you got that news and you knew that you were uh, going to be the, the, the number one driver or kind of slot into that, because originally you were a third driver in that team, if I recall. Up to Moser. Okay. And then suddenly, and I was expecting Colin to found the number one driver of experience because there's only three Grand Prix I'd done so far. And then he called me, you know, Monza was, uh, was a tragedy, as you can imagine. For me, it was the first time I had the, the feeling how tough was Formula 1 and Formula 2 as well. You know, I lost some good friends in Formula 2 as well. I think that year I lost uh, Jerry Biro, who was a Scottish, very good driver of Lotus. Uh, he was extremely competitive as, uh, you know, friend of uh, Clark's family and in one of the races in uh, Royal Le Serre in France, street circuit, mm -hmm. he went under the barrier and I was just behind him, it was horrible. But there was, we have to to understand it was part of our racing, we have to accept, it was very tough. Uh, Jochen was a big shock to me, to my family. And then I was, I, was, I was waiting, calling to call and say, you know, uh, number one is I'm going to hire Chris Amon. I'm going to hire someone with a lot of uh, experience to be number one, for, you know, driver for Lotus. And then he called me and said, hi, Emerson, I, I want you to be number one driver from now on. And I said, Colin, thank you. I will try my best. What else can I say? I try my best. And there was even a lot of pressure on me going to Watkins Glen, would be the fourth Grand Prix. Uh, we miss Canada in honor of uh, Joachim. Mm -hmm. We the, don't want the to... team with Drew, if I recall. Yes, okay. yeah, that's if, if, if it's Drew from um, most parts of Canada. And then we, we went to Watkins Glen and the whole ambience was heavy because of, of uh, Joachim for sure. And then was, you know, was a fantastic weekend. Everything happened the right way that should have happened. Uh, I had tremendous pressure beginning of the race because of dump. Uh, sometimes two wheels on the dry, two wheels on the wet. And I, I was in one way a little conservative, but I'm thinking driving the car, I cannot do a mistake. I'm not do a mistake. I'm number one driver from Lotus. If I do a mistake, I'm going to, it will be, could be a disaster for sure. me, my career. And then second part of the race when dry out the track, and then I was much faster. At the beginning I was very conservative, but was, uh, you know, was, again, I thanks God to give me this opportunity to be number one driver like that, it happened. 
and I was able to support the pressure, tremendous pressure. Tremendous I pressure. can't imagine. I mean, just the, the circumstances of how yes. you got that, that ride, and then, uh, of course, with Jokens passing, looming over the team and, and everything else. And, and then we got Reni, Reni Wiesel, the, who was a Swedish, uh, extremely competitive driver f with Ronnie Peterson. They, have, they grew up together. And Reni was my teammate for the next few races. And uh, he, he, he was a very good teammate. It was myself and Reni Wiesel, suddenly two new guys at Lotus. Right. And then, and all the Lotus history, Peter War was very good to me, who was the team manager. I had a very good support from Peter, and and because of my history with Formula Three and Formula Two, when I got into the Formula One team, it was like, you know, he was, he's coming from the history of Lotus, because I raced Formula Three, I won the championship, I raced Formula Two, I won a few races before going to Formula One, and that I was already like a, in April. I went to Team Lotus to see the Formula One cars. Herbie Blash, okay. who, who is on Formula One with Bernie, was Lotus mechanic. Herbie looked to me on the door, looking the Lotus 72, the new car, and he said, Emerson, come here. Do you want to sit down in the car? I said, yes, for sure. It right. was the first time I sat down on a Formula One car. Wow. Herbie invited me. He, he, I don't know if you follow, you follow Grand Prix of racing. Course, yeah. Herbie's a very good friend of Bernie because then he was Bernie's mechanic for the Brabant time. Gotcha. Okay. He left Lotus and went to Bernie. And then he went all the way. He retired last year from Formula One. He's the one who took the drivers to the podium. Okay, no kidding. With gray hair. I think I remember. Yeah, it's a short guy, yeah, English. Yeah. And, the, and the Herbie was on the door. I said, yeah, do you want to sit down in Formula One? My eyes were like, yes. And, and, and the all emotions. this story and the emotion, but I was already part of Team Lotus mm -hmm. because of Formula 3 and Formula 2. And I was I live in Norwich. I mean, I wake up, I went to the team. My Formula 2 team was next door to the Formula 1 team. And I was there with them you know, all the time. And they always, the mechanics, they, you started like, a, it was like a family. But it was so crazy, you no know, motor race. It was so high risk at that time. That one day Colin, after I won the championship, 72, Colin came to me. It was interesting to say these things because that's not many people hear this before. Colin came to me and said, Emerson, I'm so close to you. I like you so much now. I want you to be a little away. I'm, I'm afraid to lose you. And, and emotionally, as a driver, what, what is that like? I mean, you, you touch on something very important. You know, Grand Prix racing then is not like Grand Prix racing now. Yeah, and of course, the, the safety and, and has made tremendous strides, but the emotions walk us through that. What was it really like in those days? I mean, you said you lost close friends. I think I read somewhere in one in 10 Grand Prix drivers would lose their life in that era. Um, uh, seven to one. Yeah. The first two years I was in Formula One. There are 21 drivers, three will not be there at the end of the year. Yeah. And, and what was that like as a driver going through the paddock or um, you know, the time to race and the emotions and being able to process all that and think about the possibility of, of that reality? You, you know, we, we, when I left the home on Thursday, I look, I say, you think I'm going to be back here Sunday or not? It was a question. And we all knew this. This was reality. But when you arrive, when I arrive at the racetrack, is the passion, the love for the sport. I forgot everything. I said, I'm here to do what I do best in my life. I like the most thing I like in my life is to be a racing driver, and I'm going to focus here and and give my hundred ten percent for the sport. And I think we had to have that mentality. But we are very close friends with the other drivers outside of the cockpit. And then they always talk to each other. We, we talk about safety. Co um, Jack Stewart and Joe Bonnier started the Grand, uh, GPDA, Grand Prix Driver Association, to improve safety globally. And it was a very good move. And then we were very safe, conscious mind, even the, the risk of the sport. But 
we want to improve and we are going through a, a period of improvement and the tracks got much better the cars the, the driver's equipment the rescue team ambulance doctors i mean everything improved and now it's fantastic you know it's because of who started was joe bonnier and jack stewart and in those days we were just uh, speaking before we started recording about modern day karting drivers have telemetry literally on the steering wheel in your day, I, I was reading an interview with you where you described going to dinner with Colin and you guys would do kind of the debrief yes. over the data over dinner and, and talk about what changes you'd want to make on the car the following day. Now, in modern day Grand Prix racing, of course, they have instant telemetry. And even at the karting level, there's so much data on, on you know, for these younger drivers. What, what do you sort of see as the, the benefits or the, the detriments? Can a lot of drivers get lost in the data? Is it uh, too much so? Or what are your thoughts on kind of modern day data? Uh, it's a very good question, uh, difficult to answer, but my opinion, um, the data that they, they gives uh, what I call analytics, you have to be very analytic you know, to, to go faster and to be better in the sport. But you have so much information that these kids now with karting, they have so much information that they have to learn how to use the information to improve the way they are driving, to improve the, the car to behave. And I think that's a good base for a formula because you go to Formula 4 after go-karting, the new Formula 4 from FIA, from FIA, and you have all the electronics on board. And you have, it's very similar to Formula 1, but not as much, but the base is there. And now, the difficult to analyze, to understand all the information you have, is a challenge for exactly. these kids and for because uh, it's overload, right. right? If there's so much information and knowing what to uh, and and I think that's is it, a different challenge than on my time that I have to describe to Colin on a dinner what the car was doing, the behavior of the car for him to understand that he was a genius. He would listen on every corner, and then the you put the two fingers here, you start thinking, okay, I must I know what to do. He would go there and change the whole car, the car much better. Mm -hmm. He was a genius. And now we have this incredible support from all the electronics. But it's a challenge for these kids. It's difficult to understand everything, to analyze, to react cor correct with the engineers. It's a lot of teamwork to improve now. And that's the new Word. That's the way it is, right? It's just cellular phone, you know, laptop, computer. Everything is so much forward. That's these kids they have to learn, and I like it. I'm I'm making a program not with go kart for him mm -hmm. to be even more information than is already existing, like trying to measure the tire temperature, the pressure, because all these things he's going to learn now and use in the future. That's right. And it is it's very important. And I, I, some people say, well, it was more, e more difficult to drive on my time, you know, when we, more mechanical driving, sure. not electronical. But now, if you look at the steering wheel of the Formula One, there's so many adjustments, so many options to improve or to make the car worse. Mm -hmm. And the, the driver has to have a different talent to to have the capacity to operate all that I'm thinking myself driving from the one car today I drove three years ago the Lotus four so, years ago yeah. in Paul car and I told the engineer when I drove in I said the only thing I don't want is any adjustment put what you think is the best led me to have fun to drive the car without Sure, playing and the steering wheel and everything else. Or... And then I say, first, I, I don't have the experience. Second, I want to have fun. But these kids, I mean, these young drivers from Lawan or any category that you have adjustment in the steering wheel is a challenge. If you think about it. between one corner and the other, they change the brake balance. The next corner, they change the diff. Sure. The other. Or it's this or it's that. Yeah. Yeah. It's their brains are working a different way than I used to break. We have to adapt ourselves right. to the car. 
and now they they adapt to the car from every corner. It's crazy, isn't it? It's, it's a challenge. Look what he's doing now. Yeah. See? That's the new world. You have to accept, you have to improve. Yeah. And you have to train them. It's constant information. Yes. And I, I, I think now I want to make a, even a more a deep program for him. You know, the new camera that I saw the other day is fantastic. You see the revs, you see the speed, and you are watching. And then after one lap, you can come back here and see Oh, this co this corner you're too wide. Mm -hmm. Look at the revs you lost. I mean, yeah. incredible. Doesn't lie. Doesn't lie. It's their numbers don't lie. And, and speaking of, you, you make a great point about the modern day racing driver. And nowadays, it seems like the media and social media, in particular, Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and every Snapchat and all these other things. In your day, it was much more simple. I think a, a few reporters, perhaps some television. When you look at the modern day racing driver. Could you imagine, for instance, a, a, when an Indy, when you drank the orange juice instead of milk, what that would have looked like <laughs> in, in a social media day and people commenting and, and what sort of feedback you would have gotten? I, I, I think, you know, the, the communication is so fantastic now, so fast. And uh, everyone can communicate, everyone can say what you want to say mm -hmm. to the world. You're not limited in the country. It's, it's, it's fantastic. Um, I think it's, it's a new way of communication that helps these kids, helps the responsibility they have to have on what they read, what they write. Mm -hmm. It's very important for them. Um, I think we, we, we have to be very responsible what we write, what what read is available, anything is there. Right. But what we write, yes. You have to be responsible, um, but again, you know, the, the challenge these kids have now on a different world. If you go, people, some journalists tell me, well, these drivers now don't have the same capacity you guys had to drive a mechanical car. And uh, my, my answer, if you get top five Grand Prix drivers, top five NASCAR drivers, uh, top five Le Mans drivers, uh, top five Indy drivers, and go back in the time machine with top five from my time, right. it would be tough. Yeah. I mean, they are very talented. You know, you, you get, you know, today, Fernando Alonso, Lewis Hamilton, Nico Rosberg, uh, you know, Verstappen, who comes from go-karting. Right. Talking, you know, Verstappen is a typical example for go karting. I mean, you go back in the time machine, on my time, on the 70s, mid 70s, they'll be tough. Yeah, I can There's imagine. There's no it. doubt. They'll be very tough because they have the talent, they have the passion, and they know how to drive a race car. And, and I think if I would be younger now, I would be doing the same as I did in the 70s. I would be tough. You know, Jack Stewart would be tough, Mario would be tough, mm -hmm. Mario Andretti. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I always, I always say that you know, the top five guys on these categories in the world are incredible talent on any time, any era. You know. For the India, uh, I have to ask, when you decided to drink the orange juice, was that something that you thought about beforehand? If, if I win, I'm going to do this? Or was it something that you decided kind of as, as you won the race or kind of walk me through that whole uh, that idea? I, I had, I was an orange producer in Brazil. I, I know that, with the farm. And the, the farm for many yeah. years. And that year, I made a deal with the producers in Brazil to drink orange on okay. the podium. I won the Australian Grand Prix, and I, I drink orange, but nobody noticed. Right. I have pictures. If Eric Emir was second, I won with Roger. Right. And then I come to Indy, I saw the milk, I, I drink first orange and then the milk, but the press never put the picture. That's that's, you never did see that. They never points. show, because they say, oh, you know, right. and I drink the milk after. Nobody, I, we ha I have pictures drinking the milk, okay. but the press never used. Of course, it's a bigger because it's a big Because that's a big story. I didn't want to break it, but in one way I break it because at first I drink the orange right. and then I drink the milk. But they said, no, nah, he didn't bring it. It was very polemic. One way it was good, and one way it was bad. Yeah. I didn't want to break the, the tradition, 
but the way the press show, I like I broke the tradition, but you know, yeah, it happened. And, and speaking of indie, obviously you came over uh, fairly early on in your career and you won the title fairly quick in, in 89. Talk a little bit about the adaptation to ovals and kind of what your original experience was. And if, obviously you did really well at indie, but kind of what initially what it was like to, to jump on an oval. You know, not many people don't know, don't know, but in 1974, when I won the World Championship for McLaren, uh, they invited Teddy, who was running McLaren at that time, invited me to try Indianapolis. Always, there's a long story linked to America. When I was 10 years old, we in Brazil, we didn't have a TV broadcast. We had only magazines and films from racing. And my father was from the, it was called Automotive Sport Club. And every Saturday in the house of one of these people who loves racing, we watch documentary movies. And I watch a lot from the mid 50s, 60s, about Indianapolis. And it was uh, the Bettenhaus family, the um, Vukovic family, Bill Vukovic, Bettenhaus, you know, was the grandfather of mm -hmm. Gary. I remember the names. It was Miss uh, the, the, it was Bardau special? Because Bardau make this documentary about Indianapolis, and I watch Indianapolis. I'm thinking, one day I would love Formula One and to to race Indianapolis. Right. I had always this in mind since I was ten years old, because these documentary movies I watch from from Indianapolis. And then when I joined Team Lotus. I always ask Colin, how was to race in, with Jimmy and won Indianapolis? Mm -hmm. Colin loved him. Some Europeans hate. In Indianapolis, the Europeans, or they love it or they hate. Okay. Well, Jochen right. Rinder hates. I ask Jochen, how was to race in Indianapolis? Jochen said, oh, that was a shit place because he crashed. Of course. Uh, it, and, um, I don't know if you saw the story for Jochen in Indianapolis. He was very fast and he crashed. Tamo? And and uh, and then I always keep asking Colin, but tell me, I say Emerson, you know what's the setup of the car, the ovals. Colin explained to me, I was very interested. And then when I come for the Miami Grand Prix, mm -hmm. uh, when I retired from Formula One, um, Ralph Sanchez called my office in Brazil. I knew Ralph from the Detroit Grand Prix the Formula One race I right. had. Emerson, I want to come and drive the Spirit of Miami. Uh, I say, Ralph, I'm retired from racing. Don't, I'm not going. He insists so much. Yeah, I never been to Miami in my life. I have no appeal for Miami. I always connected to LA or to New York through Miami. Okay. I stay many years at the airport. I never went out to see Miami. To me, it was like, you know, that time was like a drug dealer place. Right. Yeah. And I had no, you know, the Miami Vice, the things, yeah, yeah. the stories. I said, what am I going to do in Miami? And then when I come to Miami, I love it. It was a very nice surprise, Miami, uh -huh. to me. You know, positive surprise. I love Miami. I'm there until now. But going back to 74, Colin said, I want you to drive Indianapolis 75 for McLaren. Mm -hmm. John Rutherford won 74. I won the championship for McLaren. And they won Canaan. They won the three. Wow. Indy, Canaan. And, and Formula One with me. First time they won Formula One. And then I flew from uh, Watkins Glen direct to uh, Indianapolis. I drove J uh, John's car, the one that he won the race. The actual car. The actual wow. car. Um, he did a few laps for me before I got into the car. I love it. But the car was so fragile. Okay. The, at that time when they hit the wall, it disintegrated. I mean, we have a horrible crash. And then I drove, I was fast. I did two days. I was picking up speed. I always like fast, long corners. Then I adapt myself to the oval. I love it. And then on my mind, I say, it's too dangerous. You know, if you are over 200 miles per hour all the time, if I hit a wall, disintegrate the car. You know, the monocoque was three millimeters aluminum. Mm -hmm. No carbon back then, yeah. And then when, in the way after I did the Miami Grand Prix in 1983, a guy called me, Pepe Romero, say, I'm, I'm making a new team for Indianapolis. I want you to drive. 
and I, and he bought Tels Fabi a year before car. And then I met the team manager who was going to be, uh, uh, was called Jim Bell, good guy. I liked it and I went to India with no compromise of victory, but to learn about Indianapolis was a great experience. I love it, Indianapolis. And driving over, you have to adapt yourself much more smooth, much more precise. Um, it was a challenge for me to learn all the technique. Um, AJ was very good to me. The first time I went to Indianapolis, he teach me a lot. And then uh, Gordon Johncock, in the beginning, he was very good to me. Uh, Mario, I mean, they all, they all, you know, and, and I like the American ambience much more than Formula One. To me, uh, you know, I did 13 seasons of IndyCar race, was the most happy of my, my professional career, in the car and outside the car. Just the culture and uh, Formula attic. One was always a lot of intrigue, a lot of go, uh, go, gossips. How you say yeah, gossip? Gossip, yeah, gossip, yeah, English, gossip. Yeah, yeah. And, and you come out of the car is always, ah, oh, you know what um, Jack Stewart talk about you? Come on, right? And they want me to answer something. Of course, and then they just go back and forth. And the, and I think in America is the uh, I call the the essence of the sport is respect much more. And like here, for these kids, you have the rules, you have to apply the rules, but the sport is a sport. Right. I see the way Tom runs, it's a sport, it's fun, we are here, we have to compete, the kids are competitive. Right. And it, it has to have integrity of the sport. Do you understand my transition? Yeah, absolutely. The integrity of the sport in America, for any sport, is more than the Europeans. The Europeans are it's, it's different than here. I like here it's my, the environment. And then I was lucky to have, you know, my my grandchildren being here. P uh, Pietro was born here. Mm -hmm. Hans was born here. Emma was born here. And uh, I love to be here. But it was a challenge for me in India to learn. I have to learn everything. It took me two years to be at the level of really competitive. Uh, you know, and, and, uh, I enjoy every second of when I was driving it. I, I think in this, the oval driving like Phoenix right. is the most challenged drive. I bet, short oval stop. The Milwaukee, yeah. flat with no banking, incredible, incredible. And when, uh, when Ayrton came over to do the test with Penske, was he ever really serious about maybe coming yes, over to the right. Dubai? I, I've been two years talking to Ayrton. You have to do the Indy 500. You have to do the Indy 500. And I was hoping he was going to do it with me. I asked Roger, I, I asked uh, Ayrton first, do you want to test the car? I said, Ayrton, yes. Come to test my car, you're going to like the car, I'm sure. Because at that time, the car was very similar to Formula One. Mm -hmm. You know, the building, the weight distribution, the power, are very comparable to Formula One, just bigger, but they are very similar to drive. And then I used to say, I go and I spoke to Roger, say, if, if he accepts, would you run extra car in Indianapolis for? I used to say yes. I you're going to be teammates with me in Indianapolis. Wow. Would be Nigel, myself, I used to be fantastic. You know? Wow. No, it would be incredible. And then he come, I was very happy that the, 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 the Firebird is a very small track, mm -hmm. but immediately he was fast. He liked the car, he was very enthusiastic. And then I raced on the oval. Uh, Phoenix, Roger didn't want it to drive. Roger said, you have to have a procedure on the oval. If you go too fast, too soon, because he's, he has incredible ability, but sometimes you overdrive, of course. and on the oval, and then Roger said, I don't want him to drive on the oval. Emerson yeah. let him, if he goes to Indy, then we, we practice. Mm -hmm. But then Ron Dennis didn't allow him to race in the numbers. But had that not been the case, Ayrton was open to doing it? Yes, so yeah, so he wanted to do it. Wow. Like Nigel, Nigel was world champion that year. Right. From the one, he joined us. You know. and, and briefly on, on Ayrton, so as I understand it, you really helped get him in, in from uh, the karting into uh, the English stuff through Ralph Furman, somebody that you... <laughs> yeah, I read something that you picked up the phone and said, I found your next... He was in my you. office when I called okay. Ralph. I say, Ralph, I have the next champion for you to be winning races. 
Oh, Emerson, I always joke around. Right. Oh, another Brazilian made the joke of me. I say, this is good. I, I promise it's going to be very good. Right. And then uh, they had always all the success, success for us. But that when I test Formula One in Brazil, Copper Suca, mm -hmm. um, Ayrton was, I think, 15, 15, 16 years old. I was 27 and finished the Formula One. He comes from the go-kart track of his father. At Angelagos, right? Yes, okay. yeah. and then, then I call him and he stay with us and he look at the car, talk to me. I always like Ayrton since he was racing go-kart. And, and not to touch on something very sad, but um, you know, as I understand it, you were testing when you got the news that, that he had passed. Yeah, it was an issue. And uh, I think a lot of Americans, maybe they read about it, but they don't fully appreciate the, just the impact that it had on your country. Um, what, what do you remember from that time and the, the funeral and everything related to it? Well, it was, you know, in Brazil, uh, soccer, of a Brazilian football, soccer is very big, huge. Mm -hmm. And motor race started to get very big. And then I won the championship, and then uh, Nelson, and then I won Indy, and Ayrton won three world championship. And then motor race was huge in Brazil. And then uh, when it happened to Ayrton, was the, the, the whole country knew. It was a big shock to everybody. And it's one of these, it's like, you know, for my history in racing, it's like when it happened, like when Jim Clark died, to me, it's not correct. Why Jim Clark died? Right. You know, uh, being a great Jim Clark's fan, like everybody in motor race knew that Jim Clark was an incredible driver. And then you think, why, you know, he, he died? Why Ayrton died? You know, that's part of the sport, but it's tough for us. Yeah, no doubt. We love sport, and, and I was very close to Ayrton. Um, and when you, and, and Ayrton was a big name in Brazil as a sport uh, legend, not just motor race, but you know, it's a big name for Brazil. And, and I'm curious. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever asked you this, but in '94, obviously after this the Ayrton thing, you were leading the Indy 500, and you were a few laps from victory. Did you have something planned? Like, I, were you thinking maybe as the laps were winding down, you know, if, if I win, I'm going to dedicate this to him, or did you have something planned? Um, I had a, um, the first segment of the race, I got a plastic bag on my radiator, mm -hmm. and I had to come in because it overheat the water, and I had one extra pit stop than everybody. And then my team manager called me and said, you have to be, just ahead of Junior, one lap. Right. You have to lap a Junior to be able to come in, make a uh, f flash and go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The splash and go with the fuel. Splash and go. Yeah, yeah. And then you still can win. And I was right behind Junior, trying to pass him, c coming out of turn four. I lost the back end, slide into the wall. And because, and then six months, uh, the. Uh, Chuck Sprang was the team manager mm -hmm. from Penske, and he was on the raid with me. Six months later, he came to me and said, Emerson, I did a mistake. Even if you're behind Junior, you could come in by the, by the, the speed limit, make the splash and go, you still be coming out and winning the race. And uh, was of course, Berlin. the fans, which is it's kind of sad, they were actually cheering when you crashed. I don't know if you knew that, uh, because they were still upset about the orange juice from the year prior. Could you hear any of that? Were you no, sort of, no, okay, no. just kind of tune that out. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's interesting, the, the, the passion, like you're saying, we were talking before we recorded, just the passion that people have for, for Indy, that something like Indian milk can, can, uh, the can get that many people upset, yes. or, but it's all in good fun. And then lastly, I would just love to touch on you know, you, you just touched on it briefly, but the Cobra Super team. Oh, it was fantastic. And, you know, a lot of people obviously said, you know, what could have been, or if you had stuck with this team or that team, how many more championships could you have won? But the the risk and the passion to do it your own way with your brother, and um, what was that era like for you? And, and kind of. It was, a ch it was a big challenge to make a Brazilian Grand Prix car. Mm -hmm. We made it. Uh, we had a very good result. The Brazilian Grand Prix finished second in 1978. Um, I was dice with Mario that won with Lotus. I passed Mario. He was world champion of Lotus that right. year. 
I, I was ahead of Gilles Villeneuve, the Ferrari, and behind um, Carlos. Carlos Reutemann won the race. That was our best result ever. And then in 1980, uh, after four years, we had the, because the Formula One team is who you have as members of the team to make the team work, of course. And that year I had uh, Adrian Hewitt, his first job with us, Harv Passwaite, um, Peter War, who has been my team manager when I won the championship with Lotus. I got Peter back again, you know, I went to McLaren, but we always very good friends, and then Peter joined us. And Keck Rosberg, a teammate. Because Keck was doing very well in, um, how they call the series in America? It was a formula. Formula. It was not Formula. It was like a Formula 2 of Canada and United States. Okay. Keck was winning everything here. Actually, Keck came from Europe to the States and winning. And then uh, myself and Peter said, so we talked to Keck to see if he wanted to be in Formula 1. And we asked him and he joined the team and he was a fantastic driver. So we had, the, we had the best people that year to go forward. And then I was sponsored by Skull. But the Brazilian press was criticized, not the racing press. Okay. The guys who understand racing are very positive. They knew we have a lot of talent behind our team. Mm -hmm. But the guys, the normal media, destroyed the team. Because and of the partnership? No, because we have not good results. Nice, 79, okay. 79, a very bad result. We had the new car that didn't work. But 80, we start, you know, coming very fast. And then uh, the, the, the PR from Skoll called me from Brazil. I was in England in July. I said, Emerson, uh, bad news for you. We are not going to continue. The board of Skoll decided not to continue because there have been so much criticized by the press. And we had a brand new car designed by Harvey and Adrian. First work for Adrian knew it. We took, we, we didn't have a budget for testing. I did few laps in Snatchton. And then we took the car to the German Grand Prix, the new car, mm -hmm. mid-season. Keck qualified fourth, I qualified sixth. First race, brand new Formula One. But at the, the end of the year, I had to stop. Because there's no, no, no budget. Yeah. But the car was a fantastic car. And Keck was incredible teammates too. Very talented, good team. Uh, Formula Atlantic. Okay, yeah, that's right. Formula Atlantic. Okay. The Formula Atlantic only exists in Canada and the United States. Mm -hmm. Remember, Keke won the Formula Atlantic Championship, and you look and say, this guy is good. You know? And uh, now, obviously, some years later, what, what emotions do you have when you walk into a racetrack now, whether it's a car track or the, the Speedway or an F1 race? Uh, do you still get excited? Do you still feel the passion yeah. from a different... different... In, in a way, in the go-kart track with Emo, see all these kids, you know, the, I'm, this is my life. Uh -huh. You know, and, and I hope I have enough health to the last days of my life to be on a motorway, on a racetrack. <laughs> you know, I hope I'll be walking the racetrack before I go away. And, and when you look at your, your grandchildren or uh, Pietro and um, you know, I know Tatiana married Max Pappas, it, the racing is very much still in the family at all different levels and um, your nephew Christian, of course. Um, when you look out, do you see the Fittipaldi name kind of continuing on in motorsports after uh, I, I think we'll continue. I'm very happy. You know, Christian won Daytona this year for the third time. Uh, he's doing a fantastic job in sports car. Mm -hmm. uh, was here at 8 o'clock this morning, just before Emo went out. Pietro called me from the airport because there was five in Phoenix. He's flying back to Charlotte, right. to Charlotte today. And he was so happy. You know, yesterday uh, he finished. Uh, when I went to sleep, Arturo, he was six. Fastest, very good, and he's very happy. First time he drive an oval, mm -hmm. and I think Pietro is very dedicated and love, passion for the sport. He's the typical example. Someone, you know, Pietro by himself, he has a book since he started uh, car driving. Uh, his uh, experience in NASCAR in Hickory, he he makes a note of every day on the track. 
all the therapy he has, what happened, he makes a report to himself. Like a diary or a journal? Yes, wow. since he started racing cars. And nobody asked to do it himself. I never asked, I never had this. Right. I never done. And he's incredible, that's focus. We're talking about passion and being focused, that's typical Pietro. And, and, and I'm very happy. And, and Enzo, Enzo is different. Enzo is more emotional, mm -hmm. more motivated. He's more up and down. Uh, both are different, but Enzo is committed to his uh, Ferrari oh, yeah. Academy. He's, he, this year will be important here because he's, he'll be the, I would say, the most important driver for Prema uh -huh. in Europe. Yeah. That's tough. You know, he's he's prepared. I mean, he's focused too. And now him is learning. I mean, we, this is learning phase for these kids. You know, they, they have up and downs. You know, the age and sometimes the weather change. Right. To me, my go kart to my time was pressure the tires and drive. Don't say anything. Just keep driving. <laughs> now there is so many circumstances. It's true. Different you bars know, and adjustments. The, the change the needle on the high speed one minute. Now, you know, now it's uh, 25 degrees, it has to be a different tire pressure. Right. It's uh, crazy, you know, I'm learning everything. I'm, you know, yesterday I was lost, I went to, 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 to Ben, Benick. Yeah. I said, Ben, I'm lost. What can I do for him? <laughs> I was lost. It's amazing. It's the amazing. technology of yes. the sport evolves. And then they say, oh, you have to put a uh, uh, stiffer shaft. I put stiffer shaft, mm -hmm. improve. But you know, I don't know, I'm learning to yeah. with these kids because it's so different from my time. And of course, the, the reality of the sport is it takes money. And one thing I've really admired about you is, uh, you know, after several championships and, and race wins, you're still very hungry and doing the marketing yes. on the PR side. Yes, yes. You and I have chatted quite a bit on, yes. on WhatsApp and we're yes. your wheel company. What are some of the lessons that some of these young drivers can learn about the unfortunate reality of raising money? Because without that money, it's very difficult to go to the next level and, and you're still as motivated and hungry as ever. You know, if, if you look the, the history of motor race from go-kart to Formula One, the Formula One team is now <laughs> searching for sponsor, for PR, for money. That's the kids, they have to learn how to look for a sponsor. They have to learn how to do PR. They have to learn, I think it's part of motorsport, part of any professional sport. But many our sport is very expensive. You need to have support from sponsors. You need to try to get more, more uh, companies involved in the sport, more people involved in the sport to, to help these kids and to help any category. We need sponsorship. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very important to have you know, this uh, focus as well on sponsorship. And all my career has been like this since I started go-kart in Brazil. And I, and I think it's important. You, know, you never, you never give up. Sometimes you know, come a, a father to me and say, "Emerson, I have no money um, to race go kart." I, I, I look to the guy. I say, "Do you have a friend that can help your kid as a friend to support your kid who has a company? Put the name of the company in the go kart and try to help you. You know, you sometimes you have to go to a friend." and yeah. ask for support and happening go kart you know it's the beginning it's difficult and, and uh, as you're saying and then we'll kind of round it off here but in the beginning you really went to europe with just every dollar that you yes. had and just laid it on the line and yes. took a chance and um, you, if you have to have that passion and that never give up attitude right that's it, that's it. and like me there's m much more other examples of people who start racing like i did mm -hmm. with no money but a, a lot of love and passion that you can achieve. I mean, there's, there's so much history, you know, for great champions that start, start struggling through the sport. It's not easy, not easy. And then lastly, just uh, any final bit of advice to any of these drivers out there, or, uh, people in, in other formulas that you can, you can offer, I'm sure they would love it, but uh, any insight into, into life or just racing or all the above? Well, I, I think again, you know, into racing, the, the love, the passion, and on the same time, is, is the respect to the, to the opposition. And I think any sport you have to, to respect the opposition. And in our sport that you are racing wheel to wheel, 
you have to respect do something to the other guy that he you expect he was going to do the same to you and that's very tough and there is a space that the cart or the car takes physical space and that space belong to you you have to respect the space from the other guy because sometimes they try to go <laughs> with two cars in one space <laughs> and I think that's uh, not that advice that they always have to remember in, in racing go-karts that you have to respect the space of sure. the other guy and, and, and the, the proximity and the respect of the driver of, uh, you see a lot of kids today they're really just it's kind of cutthroat and they're not really giving each other a lot of room out there so and then if, if my racing spears all the great champions they always respect Absolutely. and the guys who didn't have so much talent they didn't respect mm -hmm. and uh, you know racing you know so lucky to race a great champions you know like you know talking about Mario who's start Formula One before I start Mario Andretti or all answer Bobby answer uh, Nigel Manso uh, Nicky Lauda, James Hunt, Carlos Reutem, I was lucky, you know, Jacques Villeneuve, I was lucky to race with three generations and all the three generations I drove against, always the top champions, always respect. You know, I remember one race in Cleveland, myself and Nigel, we changed position I think seven times in three laps and sometimes my wheel was like two inches from the edge of the asphalt. If it would be two inches more, I would, I would spin. Mm -hmm. But, and he was on the inside, and he respected me, and I respect him. And Nigel was a tough guy. Mm -hmm. You know, one of the toughest I ever raced against. But there was always that little Always bit of respect, respect. yes. Like, just yes. enough room to yes, where yes. it's fair. Yes. And I think that's, that's example, not my example, but all the great champions, they always respect. And I think that the, the new generation have to understand that. There is a respect in any sport that you have to be on that respect and then you be respect too sure you get you, if you yes. give the respect you get yes. the respect yes. well with that emo thank you so much for your time it's always yeah. a pleasure just to chat thank with you, you. Chris. i really great, appreciated the, uh, great the opportunity interview. To, to, to ask a little bit more and get to know a little bit more so great thank interview you. chris thank you